Morning, Bridge Church. Would you stand on your feet? I'm going to read a scripture to start us out. This is Psalms 111. It says, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There it is. Come on, saints, in the amen corner. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will praise the Lord <laughs> with all my heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The Lord's works are great, studied by all who delight in him. All that he does is splendid and majestic. His righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonderful works to be remembered because the Lord is gracious and compassionate. Before we even begin worship, can you start internally by just remembering the works that he has done? He has caused his works to be remembered. You yourself are living stones, a royal priesthood, who are caused to, be, to remember the works of God. So Lord, we remember all the things that you've done for us. Your goodness, your kindness, your graciousness, your mercy, the way you've consistently given us breath in the morning, given us life in our body, the way that your goodness and your mercy has never ceased through us. All throughout our life, you have been faithful. From our mother's womb, you have caused us to know you, to see you, to experience your goodness. And so, Lord, we celebrate you. We remember all the things that you've done. And God, we stand here in faith, remembering or expecting all the things that you're going to do. You are an ever-present God, the beginning and the end. The God who is still working, still designing all things to work for the good of those who love him. So God, we choose today to bless you, to praise you, to worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade were never enough. That you came along and put me back together, and all my desires. Are now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, I know, I know. And I To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountains is still the God of the valleys, and there is no place your mercy and grace won't find me again. You give beauty for ashes. 
this song, it makes me think about Ephesians chapter 2. It says, remember that you were at a time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God. But now, how many of you know that but is a huge word in scripture? It shows a contradiction. This is what you were. You were alienated. You were separated. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood. It says, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And it says that God, that Jesus might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. And then it says, finally, for through him, we both now have access in one spirit to the Father. You are no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens, but you are fellow citizens, saints and members of one household of God. So we're singing about love and joy and peace. These things we have access to now in Jesus because he is a God of love and joy and peace. Let us pray. Jesus, it's only by your work that those who are far off can be brought near. It's only by your blood that we as guilty sinners can be declared innocent saints. God, it's only by your love that you keep on forgiving us. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a God of love. What a God of peace. What a God of faithfulness. Thank you, God, for being faithful to us while we are not faithful to you. What a God you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Bridge Church this morning. So glad to see you all here. This is our uh, 1030 a.m. service. Um, my name is Josh. I serve as one of the pastors here. And uh, maybe this is your first time here today. Maybe this is your second time. But if you are new to Bridge Church, man, we are so glad that you joined us today. Bridge, can we welcome our guests here in the building? We hope that today allows you an opportunity to connect with God. We want to make sure that you feel welcomed, you feel comfortable here at our church. We want you to feel like a VIP because we started this church to reach people where they are and help them grow. If you are new, maybe first time, second time, we want to, we're not going to ask you to raise your hand or stand up, but we do want you to give a chance to identify yourself and just say, hey, I'm new here. Um, we've made that super easy. You can pull out your phone. You can text the word bridge to 55444. Bridge to 55444. When you send that text, you'll see a link come back. Just fill out that link, and then you'll be able to claim a gift uh, from us. So again, if you're new here today, we'd love for you to identify yourself. We'll follow up with you and tell you about some things we have going on, but we'd love for you to text in and claim that free gift. Um, also, if you're new, maybe you started attending uh, last month or maybe in September, we have something called Open House. Open House is something we do for people who want to get more connected to our church. Maybe you're looking for a chance to serve. Maybe you're looking to become a member. Maybe you have some questions on what we believe, what is the structure of our church. We do all those things at Open House. There'll be a chance for us to talk about the church. You'll get a chance to meet each other, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. It's very easy to attend. It's uh, 11 a.m. to 1 on Zoom. It's this upcoming Saturday. Uh, a very simple way to RSVP is in our Bridge Church app. You can RSVP there, and you can find the Zoom link. So if you're new, you'd like to just kind of learn more about us, Open House is the best way to do that. 
How many of you all have been, uh, have or come at least once to our Wednesday night Bible study? Yeah. This is something we started last month. It's going super well. Uh, and uh, today, uh, I'm going to invite Caleb up. He's going to talk about the Bible study a little bit. What's going on, Bridge Church? Awesome. Well, my name is Caleb Asamuga. I am a member here. I'm going to talk a little bit about our Bible studies, but before I do, who has been blessed by our Bible studies? Outstanding. So the purpose of our Bible studies is to, what's the purpose of our Bible studies? The purpose of our Bible studies is to help equip people to be disciple-making disciples. And I got to tell you, I have been thoroughly blessed by these Bible studies. As someone who has grown up in a church and has been made to go to Bible studies all of my life, I got to tell you that this one right here is different, right? This one hits different, right? Um, the content, the content is incredible. Currently, we are in a study uh, about holiness. We are talking about the holiness of God. We're talking about holiness from a cultural perspective, a theological perspective, and what God requires of us as believers in terms of holiness. So it's been amazing. One thing that's been outstanding is uh, seeing the intentionality of our pastors, or shall I say our professors, right? Uh, every week they bring that heat, am I right? Um, last week felt like a master class. Um, but it was outstanding. Um, and so that's been awesome. Another thing that I love about Bible study is the, uh, the practical exercises. So we have homework, right? And, and I never thought I'd say this in my life, but I actually enjoy doing the homework. I actually look forward to it, right? And so it's indicative of the challenge and, and just helping us grow in our faith. And so if you are interested in attending Bible studies, just know that it's right here every Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. And I hope to see you there. God bless. Awesome, awesome. Uh, hey, next month, as a church, we are will be celebrating our eight-year anniversary. So on Sunday, November 20th, at our uh, normal services, nothing changes, 1030 and noon, we'll be celebrating our anniversary with a couple of special elements. But really, the super special night is Wednesday, November 16th. This is our worship and testimony night. So we're going to have uh, a worship set, uh, not here. Not here at 338 Atlantic Avenue. We'll be at 98 Fifth Avenue. We'll have some testimonies lined up. We're also going to do baptisms that night. So it'll be a very special night to um, really reflect and remember that this is a church that God started. This is a church that God has built. And we want to reflect and remember the work that he has done in our church. So worship testimony night, eight-year anniversary. We hope you can come out and be a part of that. Lastly, right now is a moment uh, for you to give. If you call Bridge Church your home, if you uh, consider this uh, your community, there are two ways to give today. You may give through our website, bridgechurchnyc.com. You can also download our Bridge Church NYC app and give mobily. Okay, we are going to continue in our series in the book of Genesis. It's called From the Start. So let's welcome our teaching pastor, Pastor Russell Berry. <laughs> Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to be amongst you and to hear all the incredible things that are happening in our midst. I got a lot to say, so I'm gonna jump right into it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for opportunities of worship. And uh, we just ask that you would um, be present, open our ears, open our hearts, and edit my words to only bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been going through this journey through Genesis uh, over the last few weeks, and for those that have been here, you know that we went, especially spent a lot of time in the life of Abraham. Uh, we last left off, he had, um, you know, obeyed God in making this incredible challenge to, in his mind, sacrifice Isaac, which God ended up providing a ram in the bush. Well, Isaac uh, ends up uh, having, uh, get, getting married to Rebecca, and they have twins. They have twins. 
Jacob and Esau. And uh, this is where we're going to focus on uh, one of those twins' life today. But before we do, there's a little bit of a caveat that you need to understand. The Bible isn't like other holy books that tend to show shining examples of the people who follow that faith as like flawless individuals. Bible don't do that. You, what we see is <laughs> not this approach to create certain humans as heroes and others as villains, but to show all of us as broken. Oftentimes the central figures in the story lack integrity and that's intentional because the Bible is ultimately pointing us to the truth that you don't just need to like get some rules under your belt to live a good life. You need God to get a new life. That's the, that's the thing. And this is very key as we look into the life of Jacob because he rarely gets it right. And upon first glance, honestly, he wasn't somebody that I felt like I could relate much to. He just seemed like kind of a jerk oftentimes. But the more I studied his life, the more I started to see myself in it. And so today the theme and what we're going to focus on, because what Jacob realizes is that the struggle is real. Turn to somebody and say, the struggle is real. The struggle is real, real, right? Anybody can relate to that? The struggle is real, right? And Jacob's life reveals of various different ways that that is true. First, let's start with family dysfunction. (laughs) Anybody can relate to that in the room? (laughs) I mean, we've already explored how Jacob's grandparents had a lot of drama in their life. Grandma told granddad to get busy with her employee so that they could have a baby, then got mad at him for it, then he blamed her for it, then dad, I mean, it's just a whole lot of issues. And so specifically when it gets to his dad, Isaac, the son of the promise, and Rebecca, they have these twins, Esau comes out first, and then Jacob. And almost from the start, the tension of favoritism is involved. And anybody who's had a family that has experienced that or parents that have favorited, you know, one child over another, you know that there is a toxic blend of explosiveness ready to happen. And the Bible actually makes clear why there was that favoritism. You see, Isaac, I mean, Jacob was more of a stay-at-home, quiet more domestic type, so Rachel naturally had an affinity for him, probably spent more time with him. Esau, on the other hand, was a roughneck. Esau was an outdoors man. He was, you know, we would like say he was all boy, right? He just stayed out, and, and Isaac loved him in part because of his, you know, personality, but also because when he would hunt, he would bring back, you know, some game, you know what I mean, that he'd cook up and eat, and like, mm. <laughs> Love that wild turkey. Um, and we can see the pain of Jacob's sense of rejection from his dad throughout his life. It's a haunting thing for him. I mean, imagine being in a position where you can just tell that Esau, the one that came out first, is the one that your dad just kind of like. It's more feeling like he just likes him better. And you're just sitting on the outside, wait, looking at it and observing it. So we get to Isaac's, the end of Isaac's life and, you know, makes it clear he's about to die. And so he decides to tell Esau, go hunt some game for me and um, I'm going to come back and I'm going to bless you. With, you know, and it's kind of hard to, for us to really paint the picture of what this, the significance of this blessing uh, official kind of ceremony is it's kind of the sim- it would be similar to like hearing the will right you know like of someone who's about to die hearing what you're about to inherit combined with hearing the definitive word of the person whose affirmation you desire most telling him telling you all the things that they see in you this is huge from his father so Jake, uh, Isaac tells Esau to, to go, go hunting and to do that and to get this blessing. Rebecca, 
Jacob's mom overhears this, that this is about to happen. So she tells the son that she favorites, Jacob, to essentially pretend to be Esau because by, um, by this point, Isaac is blind. He can't see. So mom tells the son, her youngest, to go and pretend to be the oldest so that he can get the blessing of Esau. Any dysfunction that you can see in the mix? And so here is what we get to in Genesis 27, verse 19. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. So Rebecca hooks up a meal <laughs> with food that they already had, and then they pretend that it's Esau giving <laughs> Isaac the food, right? And, he, and it works. At first, Esau is a little suspect, but then he finally gives this incredible blessing that has this binding reality of on Jacob's life. And then what we see happens next reveals how crazy. <laughs> uh, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, we read, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father, Isaac, said to him, who are you? Remember, he can't see. He answered, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it then that honey game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. You can see in Isaac's reaction how major this was and his shaking and his convulsing and his fury. His plan had been thwarted. Now, the other interesting thing that's happening in this text is that we're told earlier that when Rebecca was pregnant with the twins and they were like wrestling around in her stomach, she was like, yo, God, what's going on with these two boys? And the Lord reveals that the younger, contrary to tradition, would be the one who would be the child of promise and blessing and not the older. So in other words, God had already told Rebecca in Isaac, that it was supposed to be Jacob. But because Isaac favored Esau more, he didn't care. So even though his plan was thwarted, God's plan was not. We can see in the intensity of Esau's response another dynamic to this. So imagine that, right? Like imagine what happens and we see his reaction as soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, even me also, oh, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He has taken away my birthright and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Now, what I, Esau is referring to, we didn't cover this part because there's just so many parts of the story. But earlier in their life, this is the second time that Jacob has, strike, has uh, basically gypped Esau out. The first time happened, Esau had come back uh, from, you know, being out in the woods and doing his thing, and he was starving. And uh, he was like, yo, man, I need something to eat. And Jacob was like, well, if you give me your birthright, then I'll hook you up with some food. He's like, ah, I ain't got no money. All right, Uber Eats, boom, here we go. <laughs> and, he, and he gives up his birthright to Jacob, and now he takes the blessing away as well. Now, part of the story in all this, is a lot of ancient customs and ceremonies, but, but just to kind of cut it to a simple place, so the question becomes, why is Jacob doing this? Why is he tricking his father, tricking his, duping his older brother? And here's the thing. He was willing to do anything, even under false pretenses, to get the approval and blessing of his father. To hear I love you, to hear I 
admire you, to hear you're going to be amazing and great. And when you think about it from that standpoint, is Jacob much different than us? Yeah, we might not literally dress up like our older siblings, but you've also tried somebody else's style on in order to get a certain level of affirmation and success. To be spoken well of, to be blessed. I know I can say I've been there. Um, my parents broke up when I was two. My father was killed when I was seven. And there was the sense when he died that I didn't really know him. But my older brother is named after him. My older brother is the third. And my older brother lived with him for a few years. And so I always wonder, like, why didn't he pick me to live with him, too? And that, that gap and that hole started to steam of rejection that I didn't even experience with my older brother. We're very different people. He's an introvert. I'm extrovert. He, you know, is into, you know, how he does life differently than me. And he's more abrasive and I'm more conciliatory. And I just, I remember one time, just to show you how this is, I'm living out my trauma now, but um, <laughs> this is serious. Like, like, I remember this moment. We had a Nerf hoop in our bedroom. And he loved playing basketball, and he decided to make, like, a March Madness tournament, like, and played him by himself. Like, he was both teams. <laughs> he wouldn't let me play with him. Like, I was like, can I just be one of the teams? Um, yeah, it was tough. It was tough. I, I, thank you. Thank you. But we all have that sense where we want to have that sense of affirmation and approval to hear a parent just say, I'm proud of you. We all have a little bit of Jacob in us. We also have a little bit of Esau, too. We see in verse 41 in chapter 27, Esau's response. Now, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the, day of mourning, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Straight up. He's like, look, as soon as dad is gone... He's finished. Esau is out for blood. And I'm sure if we are honest with ourselves, we've ever, sometimes we've been mad, so mad at somebody that we comforted ourselves with their demise. Comforted ourselves with either seeing them physically or in other, word, in other ways fail in life. The struggle is real. Is it not? And we haven't even gotten to him. This is just his childhood. <laughs> like, this is him growing up. So then what ends up happening is uh, his mom, Rebecca, hears Esau talking to himself, fuming about how he's about to kill his brother. So she, she's like, you got to get out of here because you know you can't take Esau because he's about that life. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to run, right? Like, you have no shot. And so she's like, go to my brother, Laban. Go, like, go to him. And just kind of like make a life there because if you stick around, your brother's going to kill you. So he, he goes to his uncle Laban. And how does he deal with the sense of unhappiness? Because he leaves with nothing. Like, remember, Abraham is rich and wealthy and has been blessed and his father is blessed. So, you know, he stands to, by sticking around, inherit something. Even though he doesn't get the majority, he still gets something. Now he runs away and has nothing. How does he deal with his unhappiness? We see it in Genesis 29. I'm still going through. We're going to make our way. Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve you even seven years for your daughter, your younger daughter, Rachel. This is what he says to Laban. So he basically gets there. And when he gets there, he is smitten by this young woman, Rachel. Now, Rachel, it says in the Bible she fine. Now, you know you fine when you can go chapter and verse. <laughs> You want to know how good I am? God said it in Genesis chapter 28. I mean, that's pretty, that's a humble brag for you. He falls in love with her. Now, this seven years thing is an extraordinary amount because it was way beyond the typical, what we would say, dowry for what someone would offer at that in their custom uh, to, for the uh, opportunity to be married. He's overwhelmed with longing for her, but if you go down deeper, what you see is he is looking for a romantic solution. I, I didn't get the affirmation from my father. I didn't get the affirmation from my brother. Maybe if I just get it in a woman, 
in a, in a, maybe if I get it in a relationship, maybe love will be the thing that gives me this sense of affirmation and blessing. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are many a times where we have gone that same route, picking up that app, swiping left or swiping right, to find someone to fill a gap that we have of affirmation and acceptance. He tries to do that, and then that, even that doesn't work because, you see, even though he's a bit shady, Jacob, his uncle was shady too. Anybody got a shady uncle? You know, you know? So his uncle actually <laughs> pretends, like, so he sends his, older, his oldest daughter, Leah, to his bed chambers after the wedding. Now, they're veiled up, you know, Jacob's pulled a few back, and so and it's dark. It's like super dark. So like he goes in there and he's and she's like, hey, Rachel, you sound a little different. I know. <laughs> and he wake up in the morning and behold, it's Leah. And so now he's upset and he's like, well, if you work for me seven more years, then you'll get Rachel. So he gets tricked again. But he's like, I'm going to fix them though. So then what ends up happening is he then tricks Laban by basically creating this whole scenario with herds to get all of Laban's herds, which is sheep. You can look into the details. But here's the point. So he goes from seeking affirmation and blessing from his dad and his brother and then Rachel to now success in a field of career, making money. Is that something that anybody can relate to? Okay, okay, okay. Y'all think I'm nothing? All right, I'm going to show you. I got all this behind my, 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 these letters behind my name. I've accumulated this education. Look at what I'm doing. I'm killing the game on social media. We are looking for ways to affirm and bless because the struggle is real. And so with all that in the background, now we're going to get to our text, which is Genesis 32. But you have to see, once you see this, now you'll understand what's about to happen because now he, Jacob... Laban is so mad at Jacob for essentially tricking him and robbing him that he takes Leah, Rachel, and all of his stuff and runs away from Laban. And he has to run back home. But there's a problem. Back home, remember, it's been 20 years, but he thought I ain't forgot. And in 32, Genesis 32, it says, and the messengers, uh, Jacob sent some folks out, some scouts, and the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you and there are 400 men with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, you think? He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps thinking if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Jacob is shooketh. In the King James. He is so real right now that he is like, all right, I'm going to take like Leah, you and the boys and your servants and y'all go to the east. You know what I mean? Y'all, y'all go over to, you know, Flatbush and then, uh, you know, Rachel and y'all, all right, y'all, y'all go over to Crown Heights. Like, like, and we'll just hopefully, whichever one, some one of y'all make it. And I'm sorry for the ones that don't. And maybe if I'm not, if I hang back, maybe he won't kill y'all because it's just women and children. Maybe. That's how real this situation is. So he is struggling to survive. He has run out of options. His trickery can't save him anymore. He's alone. Esau's on the way. The next day, he knows daylight comes. This is about to be on. And in the midst of that, this is where we find our story. Because it says, and Jacob was alone. And at the end of the day, the reality is we can't run from our problems. We can't run from that hole of of admiration, of, of, of affirmation that we're looking for. As much as we try to shake it with relationships, we try to dull the pain with distractions, we try to just work so hard so that we can get whatever to get somebody to prove something, something to, in ourselves we don't even believe, we cannot outrun it. And this is when he has his encounter with God. You see, 
for you to really go to go there and get to that place where God can speak and reach you, you have to be by yourself. And some of us don't like to be by ourselves. Some of us just like the, the noise and the anonymity of community. Others, I mean, there's beautiful things about community. Don't get me wrong. We worship together. It has an intensity. It's a dynamic. People are dope. And, and, we, and there is an aspect of our life that has to be communal. And yet at the same time, if we're not careful, we can get caught up in movements, but not in moments with God. We can get caught up in people around us. And you know how I know? It's because... There have been times when I've been so disappointed by people that it's messed up my relationship with God. When people have let me down and rejected me or they leave the community or the fellowship and it's like, yo, do I still want to be here? And it's like, is God still there? And sometimes we have to get away. And when God meets us, he tends to do it when we're alone, physically, emotionally, spiritually in a wilderness, in a space of aloneness, where we got nothing else to lean on but God. No distractions. Are you listening right now to God? Does he he have you in a place where you are alone, or are you still distracting yourself, scrolling through? TV always on. So that's the first point, is that the struggle is real, and the struggle is private. There's an aspect to this thing where it has to just be me and God. We're going to look at the, what happens next. Because what happens next is kind of weird. It says, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Okay, now it's like, where did the man come from? And why all of a sudden he got a wrestling match going on? Like, what in the world is going on? But think about it, right? Because I don't know if any of you have ever been to, like, the country when it's dark. Like, someplace, like, not in the city, because in the city, you don't really get dark, dark. I'm talking about, like, South Carolina, like, Virginia. I'm talking about, like, I one time I was studying abroad in Cameroon. And, uh, you know, I would, we would have class, and then I would walk to my host family's house. And I was hanging out with some uh, classmates for two, like, like, maybe about 20 minutes too long. And I had a flashlight with me, but it was so dark, I could not even see with the flashlight which way I was going. Like, I was like, I had to just retrace my steps, and they had to come and get me because it was that dark. Because there's just no light out at all. And so in that darkness, you see somebody, you hear somebody coming, don't say nothing. What's going on? Who he think? He think it might be Esau. He's fighting for his life, right? Like, he's like, yo, I don't know who you is, but it's on. I'm not going without a fight. So maybe that's what he's thinking, but this is random scenario, but he's wrestling with this person. Now, I actually was on a wrestling team for two years, ninth and 10th grade. Yes, I was, uh, I was, uh, my, my, my uh, coach called me the electrician. You know why he called me the electrician? Because I was always getting pinned looking at the lights. <laughs> it was not great at wrestling. It was not great. But I can tell you, that it was the most intense, I played a lot of different sports, it was the most intense training and the most intense experience of grappling with another human being who is trying to use their weight to hold you down for like three seconds. In fact, in high school, it's only like the matches are uh, three two-minute periods, max, two minutes. That's all you get because anything more than that, you're exhausted. This dude was wrestling to the breaking of day. And even though he doesn't know who it is at first, he knows God is involved because he's experienced and he's heard the stories of Abraham and Sarah entertaining these strangers that, you know, ended up being the angels of the Lord. He's heard about these things and now he's like, yo, I think this is a scenario. God is in the mix. And don't you know, God will meet you in your weakness. He will wrestle with you. And it's so counterintuitive because in some sense, Jacob is thinking, I'm getting my life together. I got this thing with Esau coming up. And now God want to have a wrestling match with me? And, if, and you know when I think uh, when he knew it was the moment? Because at first he's like, yo, I'm kind of winning. Like, whoever this is, like, I'm, I'm giving them some of that work. Like, whatever. And then it says he touched his hip and the hip went out of socket. <laughs> and he's like, now, you know, your hip is one of the strongest bones in your body. Like, it's responsible for holding up everything. 
And it said, it didn't say he hit it. It said he touched the hip and it went out of socket. At that point, he's like, okay, I'm dealing with something different now. For someone to be able to touch your hip and to go out of it, and it was painful. Now, why the pain, God? Why are you giving us that sense of pain? Paul asked this question as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Sometimes we have to have pain in our life to keep us from becoming conceited, from keeping us from thinking, oh, well, I'm blessed and highly flavored, favored, so I don't have any problems. And because I'm better than other people, somehow the things that they struggle with, I don't have to. And God's like, nope, that's not how it works. In fact, the more close that we get together, the more we're going to wrestle with each other, the more pain you're going to feel at different points. Anybody feel like you got a thorn in the flesh right now? Something you're struggling with and you're even asking God Why? And the reality is the struggle is painful. The struggle comes with pain. It's part of the process. It's part of what's necessary. Because all of what's going on in Jacob's background and, and him getting through all of the mess of the affirmation that he's looking for from all these people, from his relationships, from his job and his success, it, 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 it had to go. And he had to get to the bottom line of saying, it's all about me and you. It's all about me and you, God. And we see this, he finally gets it in verse 15. It says, then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. This is what the mysterious man said. And he says, but Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? Because he's like, yo, something, you, that hip situation, what's going on? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So now God reveals, yo, it's me. And, I'm, and he asked him what his name was, because he said, your name, Jacob, means deceiver. It means grappler. It means it, it has this connotation of struggle with people. And he's like, you've been struggling with people. Look at what he says. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and prevailed. It's hard to describe because we, all right, so I, I, I share with them this. This is an image. When I was on a wrestling team, there was this dude named Kerry, and I caught this incredible moment. Kerry was big, and Kerry had this moment where he picked this dude up. And body slammed him, and dude, like, elbow got dislocated, right? When he came down. This happened, like, in, like right in about a second from now. When that happened, match completely over. Carry one, go get the stretch, like, get this guy wrapped up. The fact that his hip was dislocated and Jacob was still holding on shows you how desperate he was. For God, it says, look, even through the pain, I am not letting you go because finally he realized that the blessing that he was looking for from his daddy, from his mom, from his boo, from his job was only in God and he's not going to let him go. And there's a message in that for all of us. Because for in the struggle of life, because the struggle is real, there comes times where it is hard and you feel like letting go. Some of you are feeling like letting go right now. God, I don't know all this drama going on in the world, with politics, in my relationship, in my family. I want to let go. And Jacob is, is a model for us because he says, I, it hurts right now. I'm in excruciating pain, but I am not going to let go of you, God, because I realize unless I am blessed by you, I cannot find that blessing anywhere else. And God is saying to Jacob, I'm the one you've been wrestling with your entire life. You think that the issue in your life right now is Esau coming up tomorrow. No, the issue is you are not in fellowship with me. And all this trickery and all the ways in which you try to make yourself significant in other people's eyes, that ain't it. You're trying to be your own Lord and Savior. And I, and until you realize that the issue and the struggle is me, that the problem beneath your problems is a relationship with God, that until you get to the wrestling, you cannot get to the blessing. He 
says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm t- it, life is hard. And there are times where all of us get to a place where I'm like, I don't know, science, faith, I don't know, money, problems, I don't know, sickness, I don't know, relationships, I don't know, leaders that disappoint me. And he's like, don't let go until God blesses you. Stay holding on. Even if it takes all night long and, you, and it's painful, keep holding on. And as a result of this, God is finally at a place where he, he can change Jacob's whole persona. Of course, we already went through this with Abram turning into Abraham, Sarai turning into Sarah. When God changes someone's name in the Bible, it is incredibly significant because it's realizing a difference in their character. So when changing his name to deceiver and grappler and wrestler to Israel means struggle, one who struggles with God. It's like now you get it. Now you finally understand what that the treasure is me. Not anything else but me. And this is why the struggle purifies and promotes us. The struggle purifies and promotes us. First of all, it purifies Jacob because he finally gets to the place where he recognizes that it's not any of this other stuff that I needed. I don't, it, your dad never has to say, well done to you. I'm proud of you. You never have to get to a place where somebody looks at you all googly eyes and he's like, oh, now I finally have something to do on Valentine's Day. But now I can feel like I matter. You may never get the sense of career promotion that you desire and and feel like you deserve. And you know what? It still doesn't matter because God is with you and says, I see you. You're worth it to me. And I have a plan that outseeds, uh, outpaces anything else that you could imagine. C.S. Lewis put it this way, God whispers to us in prosperity, but he shouts to us in adversity. Some of us are like, dad, but why do I got to go through the struggle? Sometimes we don't listen to nothing else. We don't. I mean, it's just just time-tested human, you know, anthropology. So we see in this. He won't let him go, it says, until he blesses him. The only way to get to intimacy with God is you got to wrestle. God ain't afraid of your wrestling. He's not afraid. It says, so Jacob called the place, called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him, and he passed Peniel limping because of his hip. From this point on, for the rest of his life, Jacob walks with a limp. It's a constant reminder. Yo, what happened to your hip, Jacob? Yo, I wrestled with God. And sometimes wrestling with God will leave a permanent mark. A permanent reminder of the fact that I struggle, but yet God could have wiped you out (laughs) because if anybody that could touch you and your hip come out of place, it could have been a lot worse, but he chose not to. It's a position of grace and a position of reminder. And so Jacob names this place based on the very name of being in the presence of God. He never forgot that moment. How could he? He limped for the rest of his life after that. The struggle prepares us for his presence. That's what it reveals, right? I saw God face to face. I wrestled with God face to face. Before Jacob was even in Genesis chapter 8, if you do this, then if you bless me, then I'll, I'll, I'll serve you in this way if you bless me. He ain't saying that anymore. It's like now your presence is the blessing. Now your presence is the blessing. Do you have a approach, approach and a posture that says, I will not let you go, God. I won't let you go. Anything else can go, but I will not let you go. Now, there's a really other, there's so much here in this text. One of the weird things, in verse 25, it says that the man, right, which we now know is a, is, is a theophany. Somebody say theophany. theophany. Theophany is just a theological word that talks about these appearances of God in the Old Testament. These appearances of God. And so when Abraham was meeting with Sarah and these three angels came and they served, it was a theophany. 
But the weird thing about understanding that this man was, was God incarnate is it says in verse 25, he could not overpower Jacob. So I was like, wait a minute, is, how does that work? That God could not overpower somebody? And this reminds me again of when I was uh, on a wrestling team for that brief moment. Because you see, sometimes we didn't have enough sparring partners. And, um, and so the coach would come in and help and kind of try to teach me technique and moves. Now, I was at the time 98 pounds in my freshman year. I was a small guy, right? And in fact, even though I never beat anybody, I still had a winning record because I would get so many forfeits from them not having a 103 pound weight class. True story. <laughs> but in any case, when the coach would come and if he was showing us a double leg takedown move or a single leg or he was showing us what to do, then he would not use all of his weight. He was a big guy. He would not use all of his weight because the goal was to show us how to do the technique, not to beat us. <laughs> oh, some of you see where I'm going with this. God made himself weak because the goal wasn't to beat Jacob. It was to get Jacob to wrestle with him so that he understood what it meant to wrestle with God for a long time. See, God lost, but he also won. Because Jacob turned into the person that he was supposed to be because he allowed him to wrestle with God. But you know what? The thing I get excited about, this isn't the only time God chose to release up on his weight and to pull up on his weight. This ultimately points us to the cross. You see, Jacob wrestled with the full weight of God. It, it, with the, not the full weight. J Jacob wrestled with part of the weight of God. God didn't give it to him all the way. He didn't give him the whole work. But on the cross, Jesus got all the weight. On the cross, Jesus got the full wrath of God for our sin. And he held on and did not let go. Not so that he would be blessed, but so that we would be blessed. That's the good news of the cross. Because ultimately, we cannot experience the transformation of turning from Jacob, deceiver, to one who struggles with God on our own. We need one who intercedes for us. And now God can bless those who deserve the curse because he cursed someone who deserved the blessing. Man, that's good news today. That God can bless those of us who deserve the wrath, right? When we look at our past and our history, we can see that. But because he cursed Jesus on the cross by him who knew no sin, somebody was there at Bible study, becoming sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God, he can now bless us. Jesus held on, not so that God would bless him, but he would bless us. So what's the point for us? He says, well, just be like your daddy, your heavenly father. What will change you is realizing that he became weak so that we could become strong. Prayer is a form of wrestling with God. Struggling to be in his presence even when you don't feel like it, is a form of wrestling. Even when you have doubts and unanswered questions, is a form of wrestling. Anybody who's walked with God for a while got a little limp. There's something or someone that has hurt you bad, that has hit you bad, a disappointment that you've had. But even in the midst of that, when you keep walking with God, then like Israel, you continue to struggle and see God's blessing is not in being at a place where I can run as fast as I used to, but I know where to run to. Do you have a limp? That limp is to make us less reliant on ourselves. Where is God painfully dislocating your plans? <laughs> I t hey, uh, Jacob, like I said, is real. The struggle is real. Where is he dislocating your plan so you can refocus on the blesser and not the blessing? You will never become who you're supposed to be unless you keep wrestling with God and say, I'm not going to let you go. No matter how difficult life gets. The reality is that his name, Israel. This is the first time we see the name Israel in the entire Bible. A name that you're going to see throughout the whole rest of it. As the name that identifies God with his people from this point on. And that name means to struggle 
with God. The struggle is real, but so is the God of Israel. The struggle is real, but so is the God of the struggle. This is not coincidental. This is not peripheral. This is at the center of what it means for us to walk, which is why he called his people Israel. And why we get to be engrafted into that struggle and into that place. Are you wrestling today? I'm done. Are you at a place where you may not be feeling it? You may be feeling more of the pain than the sense of the blessing. But know that you're not alone. We struggle in private. We struggle to purify and promote. God promotes and purifies in the struggle. But we ultimately struggle to be in his presence. That's the joy. That's the goal. That's the delight. And, and it sometimes takes the wrestling for us to realize. I remember when I was younger thinking, I want Jesus to come back, but I want to get married first. I want Jesus to come back, but I want to experience sex first. I want Jesus to come back, but I want to have kids first. I want Jesus to come back, but I want to see this. And then when you get to a certain place and you realize, I just want Jesus to come back. He is the blessing that nothing in life can fulfill. And once you realize that, once you grasp that, then wherever, wherever you are with all of those other things, it matters less. Because he matters more. Are you struggling today? The struggle is real, but so is the God of Israel. Would you stand with me as we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you, and I know in a room this large and in a broken world in which we live that um, there's a lot of pains that you reminded people of today in their families, in their relationships, in their longings that have been unmet and unfulfilled. And yet, God, I pray that in the midst of this, that you, the God of all comfort, would comfort us with your very presence. Lord, as we walk with the limp, would you remind us that as long as we walk with you, we will still get to where you have us to go. And that even broken people from the past can't stop your plan for us. Lord, we thank you and we worship you for being the God of the struggle, for not putting your full weight on us, but allowing us to be in your presence because you put the full weight on Jesus. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
this morning for the Lord. If there was something God used from Pastor Rasul's sermon that really impacted you, maybe you would like some prayer. Pastor Rasul is going to hang up, hang out up here after the service. You can come up. He'll pray for you. Um, If you are new here today, uh, please text in before you leave. Uh, If you text in, I would love to, I'll be outside on the sidewalk. I would love to meet you for a moment. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we'll dismiss. 
God, I pray that we hold on to you this week. Maybe some are wrestling with you. Maybe some were wrestling with you last night, just struggling to hold on. God, even if we let go of you, don't let go of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good Sunday.